Uh, I'm David Catling. I'm at the University of Washington in Seattle. And this is an outline of basically what I'm going to talk about. So the first topic is um, how the atmosphere changed and increases in oxygen levels, which basically is something that happened and determined the history of our planet. It's why we're here. We're breathing oxygen. But it also affected many other gases and biogeochemical cycles. And my perspective is that this change can be thought of as a slow change in the various fluxes that control oxygen. And, and a crude analogy is like an acid-base titration that, that maybe we all did in, in high school chemistry, where you titrate a buffer and then suddenly it changes from acid to alkali or something. So you basically had to get rid of things that were consuming oxygen and then oxygen could flood the atmosphere. The second part is other gases and how the climate changed. And the point I want to make, or the overall point, is at least for half of Earth history, we didn't have oxygen. So how might one then detect life on other planets in the absence of oxygen? And here I'm going to turn to the concept of chemical disequilibrium as a possible sign of life and talk about how that's changed in the atmosphere since uh, 3.5 billion years ago and then what that suggests for a possible biosignature on exoplanets without oxygen and how we might detect that. So let's start with part one, how we got this high oxygen atmosphere, bearing in mind that these principles should be general enough to apply to other planets, other exo-Earths. This is time on the x-axis in billions of years ago, and here on the uh, vertical axis, things have changed a bit from Mac to PC, but um, hopefully you can read it. Uh, and this red line is a sketch of oxygen levels uh, through time based on various proxies, which I don't have time to go into, but in the Archean, which is the eon of Earth history from 4 to 2.5 billion years ago, there were very low levels of oxygen, less than a part per million. And then oxygen rose in a so-called great oxidation event, 2.4 to 2.2 billion years ago. And then was at some low level, which is a bit poorly defined, but uh, not enough um, uh, oxygen for animals, for example, to arise. That happened later, after a, another rise of oxygen about 600 million years ago. And then we go to something which approaches the modern system. One can think of this as three steady states. One, two in the, in the middle, and then three at the end. And that must result from some kind of approximate balance between oxygen sources and sinks. So oxygen, if you, any gas in the atmosphere and its, uh, its abundance is governed by a differential equation like this between sources and sinks. And in the case of oxygen, uh, oxygen is produced for every mole in photosynthesis. There's a mole of organic carbon. And those can just react with each other and remake uh, carbon dioxide and water. So you have to get rid of the organic carbon. You have to bury it to separate it from the oxygen. And that's the net source of oxygen. So we can think of the burial of organic carbon as a net source of oxygen, or the reducing power can be also be passed on to sulfide. If you lose hydrogen from something, you oxidize it. If you add it, you reduce it. So when the Earth loses hydrogen to space, it's an oxidizing flux that allows more oxygen in the atmosphere. So these blue ones are sources, and the red ones are sinks. And on this side, there's many um, types of sinks for oxygen, which is a very reactive molecule. It can react with volcanic gases like hydrogen, carbon monoxide. They can also come from metamorphism when you heat something up and pressurize it, but it doesn't melt, otherwise it's volcanism. Or things on the seafloor. Or it can dissolve in rainwater and turn rocks which contain iron red. That's oxidative weathering. So these flux changes, the various terms here, must, their balance must have changed through history to change the oxygen level. Today, this sink, the, the kinetically efficient sink, is only 30%. That allows a high level of oxygen, and so the sink is dominated by oxidative weathering. But before there was oxygen in the, in the atmosphere, there wasn't this term of oxidative weathering. There was a different balance. So the modern balance is like this, where the oxygen source is balanced by these sinks, you can see the arrow here is this, essentially the source of oxygen, and it balances these arrows, which I've drawn roughly in proportion to what the evidence suggests. 
When we look at the ancient Earth, we see signs that oxygen was around from various traces that are sensitive to oxygen, molybdenum, chromium, sulfur, and their isotopes. So there's a curious phenomenon, which is oxygen producing life appeared, cyanobacteria that make oxygen, but the oxygen was all being consumed by reacting with things in the environment and stopped its buildup until the latter part of this Archean eon. And we even see signs, of course, that there were, this is a micro, fossilized microbial mound from 2.7 billion years ago. This is about 35 centimeters long, that hammer. Uh, and this, this is uh, from Northwest Australia. And, and the scale of these kind of things and its location suggest it was probably oxygen producing a cyanobacteria that made these, these mounds, these stromatolites. So the bounce in, on the early Earth, say 2.7 billion years ago when we were just looking at that stromatolite, is different from the modern. We don't have the weathering sink. Instead, we have the efficient, the rapidly, kinetically efficient sink of gases and things like iron, dissolved iron in the ocean. So I've drawn that as a big arrow. And it's essentially eating up this flux, which is producing oxygen. And, and in this situation, you don't have oxygen in the atmosphere. Instead, you have an excess of reducing power. So you have hydrogen uh, or methane that can build up, and then hydrogen escapes uh, from that uh, uh, environment. So it's quite different uh, qualitatively and quantitatively to the modern system over here, where I've drawn the appropriate box model. And in fact, one can sort of put in numbers because the flux of hydrogen escape um, basically is proportional to the hydrogen bearing uh, reducing molecules in, in the upper atmosphere, such as methane. We think that it was probably dominated by methane in the Archean. And this comes from physics. You can work out what this constant is, and then you can shove, put some numbers in for these fluxes, some estimates based on modern, and we can calculate that there would have been about a thousand parts per million by volume. And then if you also had oxygen, which was in some way related to the methane flux, you can do photochemical models and work out what the ground level of oxygen would be. So something very small, like a part per billion in this case, which we published previously uh, in detail. What about the middle part of Earth history? So the middle part of Earth history we can think of, that's the Proterozoic Eon from 2.5 billion years ago to 541 million years ago, which is the beginning of the Cambrian period. Um, and then in this middle part of his history, 1.8 to 0.8 billion years ago, sometimes called the boring billion, because oxygen levels are fairly low. Uh, not a lot seems to happen in the evolution of life. The climate seems pretty stable. And a bounce in this case is simply that the kinetically efficient sink on oxygen is bigger than the weathering sink. And in such a situation, one can calculate that the oxygen level is moderated. How it's moderated is an issue of debate, but Probably the best candidate is that the seafloor was still essentially holding back uh, levels of oxygen, because in fact there's evidence that the deep sea remained free of oxygen. So one can think of the Earth history of atmospheric oxygen as going through these steady states, and the terms are changing. So this was the biggest sink, the volcanic and metamorphic sink. Then that changed uh, that... Um, the flux of oxygen actually exceeded that, and weathering kicked in, so the continents turned red 2.4 to 2.2 billion years ago. And then we go to the modern situation when there's a different bounce. Of course, there are feedbacks at these rises, uh, which one could talk about, and basically they, they help the system along to our oxygen-rich world. When oxygen rises, it's incompatible with methane in the atmosphere because it oxidizes it like it does today. And we might say, well, OK, that's the history of oxygen. What about the other gases, like nitrogen and carbon dioxide? This is a sketch. This is the same kind of uh, thing I was just talking about. Here's the oxygen rising, and methane goes up when methane-producing uh, methane, methane, methane life originates, and, uh, but it falls when oxygen goes up. And in general, uh, there's um, reasons to believe that the carbon dioxide level has generally fell as we go forward in time. Uh, in a sense, there appears to have been something that was like a negative feedback keeping the Earth's climate system stable over time that affected the carbon dioxide level. And I'll talk about that in a minute. 
But I also want to talk about nitrogen, which some people think appeared in the atmosphere and was like a noble gas uh, and didn't change. But there's now evidence that perhaps the nitrogen level did change. Uh, that comes from fossil raindrop imprints. These, these are fossil raindrop imprints from 2.7 billion years ago, these little dimples. I don't know whether you can see that. You can probably see the meerkat, which is standing on them uh, for scale. But basically, we analyzed these raindrop imprints, little craters, terminal velocity depends on air density. It gave us a constraint. Of course, there's lots of uh, uncertainty. We also looked at uh, bubbles that uh, appear in lava flows. And those put constraints that basically 2.7 billion years ago, the uh, barometric pressure, the pressure at the Earth's surface of the atmosphere was less than half a bar, which was a bit surprising, uh, lower than today. But then it makes sense because we know that uh, nitrogen gets returned to the air through um, oxidized intermediaries of nitrogen um, that uh, basically uh, bacteria can use to make N2 gas. And without oxygen in the, in the atmosphere or in the environment, that um, return pathway for nitrogen is throttled. And this is a diagram of the geologic fluxes of nitrogen. It comes out of volcanoes. Today, the oxygen in the atmosphere uh, dissolves in rainwater and reacts with organics on the continents and makes nitrate, which can then be turned into nitrogen gas. These two fluxes are about equal. So this is half of the supply of new nitrogen. This is half of the supply. What happens in the Archean is you knock out half of that supply because you don't have the oxygen. Also, the deep sea ocean, the stable form of nitrogen is ammonium, and that can actually go into clay minerals, which can uh, turn into things like micas or even um, uh, nitrides, which are very um, refractory and can go down into the mantle. So there's actually an exit path uh, that existed that doesn't exist today on the early Earth. And we think that could explain why their nitrogen levels may change over time. Well, let's go back to the carbon dioxide and climate. Um, there's something in the Earth system called the carbonate silicate cycle, which is generally um, accepted to stabilize the climate on time scales of a million years or more, roughly speaking. And the way this works is that if there's a lot of carbon dioxide and the Earth is essentially too hot, the carbon dioxide dissolves in rainwater. It now has acid weathering, so it makes carbonic acid. It, it reacts with the silicate rocks. It, it, and the uh, carbonate and bicarbonate end up going into the ocean and precipitating as calcium carbonate or limestone. It's a removal mechanism. And if it's too cold, then the hydrological cycle shuts down and carbon dioxide accumulates from outgassing from volcanoes. So this system can regulate the Earth's climate. And in fact, if, you, if, you, if these things are not in balance, you can do an experiment and say, well, let's suppose there's an excess in outgassing. Then you quickly go to a situation, this is in parts per million, so this would be one bar. You quickly go to a situation where the Earth gets very hot, or if you decide the balance is in the other direction, the Earth would quickly, within a few million years, get extremely cold. So there has to be some kind of negative feedback and balance. And you can model that. You can look at the kinetics. Uh, you can look at the chemistry. You can look at the kinetics of the seafloor. So if it gets really quite warm, uh, this reaction can actually happen on the seafloor. You can release the calcium from minerals in the seafloor, and in veins in the seafloor, the calcium can precipitate. And we've looked at that with uh, lots and lots of data uh, to uh, verify that this kind of system works over the last 100 million years. And then we thought, well, let's just extend the model back 4 billion years. Why not? Um, and here's time going back 4 billion years. And here's various things that we get uh, out of our model, or we can also run this in an inverse way, where we fit to data such as it is, which is pretty poor. So these are constraints on, for example, partial pressures of carbon dioxide from fossilized soils and other sources. As you go back in time, the sun was fainter, 30% roughly, 4 billion years ago. And so you need more carbon dioxide to keep the Earth warm. And what happens is the carbonate silicate cycle basically sets that uh, carbon dioxide to be somewhere between, uh, typically um, around uh, a few hundred millibars or uh, 0.1 to 0.5 bar by 4 billion years ago. We've also put methane in here, that's why there's this glitch, which is at the great oxidation event. When you have a lot of methane, you don't need as much uh, CO2 because methane is a greenhouse gas. We can also predict 
or um, calculate things such as the ocean pH, and basically it's quasi-neutral, a little bit more acid as you go back in time. We can look at sinks of carbon in the system. So that's what we think about the Earth's um, uh, atmospheric evolution in, in a nutshell, in 15 minutes. Um, and now we can ask the question, if we viewed this early Earth remotely, how would we find life without oxygen? So when we talk about biosignatures uh, on exoplanets, obviously the most common biosignature that people talk about is oxygen, because overwhelmingly the oxygen in our own atmosphere comes from oxygenic photosynthesis. Can this concept that's been about in the literature since the 1960s of chemical disequilibrium help? Well, what is that concept? It was proposed first in a Nature paper in 1965 by Jim Lovelock. He said we should search for compounds in the atmosphere of a planet that are incompatible on a long-term basis. In other words, they react with each other and should disappear. So that if we see them, something strange is happening. There's a large flux of these molecules. Or in the modern atmosphere, Carl Sagan said, oxygen and methane are in extreme thermodynamic disequilibrium. They're suggested of life. So methane should react with oxygen. They should disappear. They should make carbon dioxide and water in uh, the net chemistry of the atmosphere. The fact that they don't means there's something on the surface, the grass, the cyanobacteria in the ocean, the tree that's making the oxygen, and the microbes inside this cow's gut that are making the methane. That's a sign of life. But the atmosphere changed. So what, how did this disequilibrium change over these kind of changes of atmospheric composition? And does it have anything to tell us about life on the early Earth? So we decided we would calculate that because this idea of disequilibrium had been bandied about, but nobody had actually uh, calculated it over Earth history. So we did, because it's just chemistry, so we can do that. Um, and this is what you get. So the disequilibrium of the, uh, this is, these are, of course, there's big uncertainties as we go back in time. And, and so this big uh, uh, um, thing here, this rectangle, represents the uncertainty in the atmospheric composition. What we've got here is the uh, energy you would get if you take a mole of atmosphere and you react everything to equilibrium. You get a certain amount of energy out the available Gibbs free energy. So that's what we're plotting, joules per mole of atmosphere on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And the disequilibrium of the current modern Earth system, and in fact going all the way back through the Proterozoic to 2.4 billion years ago roughly, when oxygen uh, flooded the atmosphere, is the methane and oxygen, that's a small component, but actually oxygen, nitrogen, and water wants to be nitric acid in, in equilibrium. And these contribute to this big disequilibrium. Now what's interesting is that on the early Earth, actually the atmospheric gases want to be ammonium bicarbonate in equilibrium. And so what, we, what actually is the disequilibrium signature of life on the early Earth is the coexistence of relatively high levels of carbon dioxide, which is one end of the redox spectrum of carbon, and methane, which is the other end of the redox spectrum, but nothing in between, no carbon monoxide, because that actually gets eaten by a variety of microbes to very low levels, at least at ground level. So we could look for CH4, CO2, and little carbon monoxide, the in-between gas in the redox spectrum, as a sign of life, because that was the sign of life on the anoxic Earth. But this disequilibrium persists only by replenishing the methane, because it's destroyed in, on the early Earth quickly, relatively speaking, in geological terms, in 30,000 years. Could abiotic uh, methane do this? Well, if you had outgassing, you had some, it doesn't outgas hardly at all from volcanoes today, but um, methane, but in low temperature systems, such as hydrothermal systems, where you can convert, uh, you can oxidize the iron with water, and you can make serpentine, so it looks like snakeskin serpent, serpentinization, um, you can make hydrogen, and with that hydrogen, you then, in theory at least, uh, you could use that hydrogen and carbon dioxide to make methane. This is called fischer tropsch type reactions. The key thing about this reaction, it's never actually conclusively been shown in natural systems. It's a hypothesis, and in fact, there was a recent paper, which is quite important, I think, which showed 
various pieces of evidence that this doesn't actually happen in the seafloor, but let's suppose it does uh, to keep people happy. Then we can calculate how much methane we can get using an equation where we calculate the iron available and then the fraction from which you can make hydrogen and the fraction from which you can make uh, methane. We use the numbers in the literature for the most generous ranges. We sample them a million times. We build up a probability distribution. And we can't get enough abiotic methane to match the modern flux or indeed uh, those suggested in the literature for the Archean. And this because it's basically kinetically slow to make this abiotic methane as a, as a short article, uh, which is well worth reading, suggests from last year. These levels of um, methane at the high end then would produce about 1,000 parts per million or more of methane in a CO2 background atmosphere or CO2 nitrogen, and that would be a good biosignature. So can we find that? This is a um, simulation of data from the James Webb Space Telescope. Here's the, here's the data we really want, this blue line, and here's the actual data, this horrible noise. Buried in here are CH4, CO2, and CO uh, uh, absorptions that we'd like to find. We've assumed a TRAPPIST-1G, um, this is the near-infrared, near-spec prism transmission spectrum. We've stacked 30 spectrums to try to beat down the noise. Um, can we actually retrieve something useful from this? If you run a retrieval, you can. You can get, of course, probability distributions for the, we put in a percent of CO2 and a percent of methane, and they peak, roughly, the retrieval at those values. And we put in, in this case, no uh, carbon monoxide. And basically, we were able to say that after four years of uh, getting our transit data, stacking them up, yes, we could, in fact, detect life on an oxic planet. So, to conclude, the history of uh, oxygen is key to atmospheric evolution. It's a, a balance of sources and sinks. The history of gases are all interconnected in the climate system. On the early Earth, the key disequilibrium, which was a sign of life, is related to methane and carbon dioxide together in sufficient abundance. And in principle, it is detectable in, in the near-term future with telescopes. Thank you.